So tonight's is titled, In the Most Holy Place, but part two. And still we're looking at the question, how should we be living? While Jesus is in the most holy place, we can't live the same way that we would if he was in the holy place. So we turn first to Revelation 2, our 7, verses 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, of course, we understand that this sealing work starts when the latter rain is being poured out. But, obviously, from this text, he was planning to do that sooner. But because people weren't ready, they hadn't been doing what we're supposed to do in the Most Holy, while well, he's in the Most Holy Place, he had to postpone and, and wait until... Uh, we would be in a position where he could do this. And of course, that's something we should be thankful for and sad for at the same time because of the fact that he's had to wait. But on the other hand, we might have missed out if he hadn't waited. So that part's a blessing. Well, I believe the third angel's message is describing what we will be like when we are sealed. And so it describes it here in Revelation 14, verse 12. <clears throat> here is the patience of the saints. Do you need more patience? Well, you're going to have more. Because one of the marks of each one of God's people in the last day is how patient they are. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Not break the commandments, but here's the ones that are keeping the commandments. And of course, it's not in our power uh, to do that, but through learning how to lean on His power, how to allow Him to have full access in our life, brings us to the place of keeping the commandments. And the third and the faith of Jesus. Well, there's probably more than one thing intended in that little phrase. Uh, the 144,000 will have faith the same way Jesus had it. That's the way all the blessings come, is through faith. Also, we could take it as a noun, the faith of Jesus. They believe what Jesus believed, what he taught. Uh, and so they have become... Uh, like him. Now, to what is necessary to get there, to that experience. And this isn't the entire list, but it's some important things. Early Writings, page 58. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with worldly thoughts and cares. I saw that some minds are led away from present truth and a love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books. Others are filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat, drink, and wear. Now these are common mistakes that are made, but God is calling us during the most holy place time away from those things. Trying to help us recognize that's holding you back. You're not able to progress like I want you to progress. And there's two primary things mentioned here. But as I think about reading material, I think, wow, Satan has advanced far beyond reading material today. And the visual is so gripping. 
and they know how to put it together so that it is so gripping. You know, even if you look at something on YouTube that's okay to look at, but it's so gripping, you want to look at another one and another one. And before long, your time for reading the Bible has been compromised. And so we really are up against a, a very difficult situation and reading may be a problem to some people still, but I think it's the visual that's far more a, a problem to us today. And so if we have slipped into that, uh, this is a call to come back from that. Uh, I got started there for a short while looking at some things that were, you know, they were not bad at all. Uh, you wouldn't call it sinful at all. But I started realizing, I don't have time for this. And so I quit, I quit looking at those things. Unless it's something that has to do with, you know, learning more spiritual truth or whatever. I just don't uh, look at it. Also, it's so easy to get perplexed and worried over how we're going to make a living. You can see that the Lord uh, gave Larry some experiences like that. And it, it's real easy to, when you're in a rough spot where you already can pay your bills and you can hardly make it, to uh, get all wrapped up in that. And that takes us away from the things that we really need to be doing to fortify us and to prepare us for this time. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished and that time can last but very little longer. If that was true when she wrote it, it's abundantly true today, right? That we are just on the verge of Him wrapping up the work in the most holy place. So, here's the advice in view of that. What leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last days. We all have some spare time, I'm sure. Or if we don't, we've got to figure out how to get some. <laughs> but in that spare time, the first priority has to be spiritual material, especially the Bible, writings of Ellen White, anything that's going to help us be ready for when our name comes up in the judgment. This is just a continuation of the same reference. Some are looking too far off for the coming of the Lord. So they are fooled into thinking they have more time than what they actually have. Time has continued a few years longer than they expected. Therefore, they think it may continue a few years more. And in this way, their minds are being led from present truth out after the world. What this says to me is that we need to think that it's soon. And we need to think that we just barely have enough time to get ready. And for the, that reason, we got to really focus on the getting ready so that when he comes, and he has to uh, come to our name and he comes to the close of probation that we're in and not thinking we have more time and we fail to really uh, focus adequately. In these things I saw great danger for if the mind is filled with other things present truth is shut out and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. 
this is an interesting point. It sounds like that as we move forward in while he's in the most holy place, more and more we are going to focus on present truth. Now all the rest is valuable, but we also are going to focus on present truth. And of course, the three angels' message is present truth. The uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit can do for us is present truth. There's a lot of things that are present truth, and there's things that we are yet to discover from steady, or someone else discovers it, and we examine it and say, yes, uh, I can see that this is present truth. And this is a, <clears throat> a very important focus for us in these last days. <clears throat> My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually and let them crowd out worldly thoughts and cares. Now, if you're not careful, you miss a key point there. This time, it speaks of the Ten Commandments and the writings of Ellen White, plus the rest of the Bible, because the Bible is basically divided into two categories, commandments, the testimony of Jesus. But that phrase includes the writings of Ellen White. So the, uh, the danger we have is that all these other things crowd out our time examining those things. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. You know, I listen to the Christian station here whenever I'm in the car and not everything they say is good, but I was really impressed with one of the uh, disc jockeys, I guess you call them, that runs the station. He said, I woke up this morning and I was thinking about such and such a verse. And I thought, well, how many of us as Adventists wake up in the morning thinking about a verse of Scripture? And yet this man is, you know, in that, in that groove already. Live <clears throat> and act holy in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. So our whole focus is to meet Jesus because we believe He's coming very soon. We believe the work in the holy, most holy place can't last much longer. And so our whole focus is to get ready. And then it warns us, the sealing time is very short. Now I realize that short is a relative term and we don't know how short, but if it says short, we better pay attention because it could be way shorter than we expect. And that's why we have to get focused even now, even before we get into the sealing time and the time when the latter rain is being poured out. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time when the four angels are holding the four winds to make our calling and election sure. Now we've looked at some areas. I'll just review. Didn't say all these phrases, but I believe these phrases are included in what we read. Number one, most of us could get some time for Bible study and Spirit of Prophecy study by doing less visitation in the area of common talking. In other words, things that when Jesus comes, they don't matter at all that we talked about that. It, it may not have been sinful, but it just doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And we need to focus on the things that really matter. Common talking with friends needs to be 
cut down or even cut out if you know if necessary number two is the use of the internet well all we're all familiar with those that are addicted to that but uh, almost all of us have to use the internet and therefore we may use it more than we should in different things not so much watching of TV now it's more watching uh, things on the internet but still it can be a problem and the videos you know and so forth all that area you need to watch that probably this church is not concerned with these things but many are that they need to cut out the games and the sports that they've been involved in and take that time and put it on the things that really matter and to make sure that they are on the path to get ready for Jesus to come. Next I want to talk about some things that have to do with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts of the Apostles, page 37, it says, The disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men and in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. And this, of course, is talking about before Pentecost. So we are before latter rain, and it seems like it would be wise for us to be doing this, to be praying with intense earnestness. Now, when we have our prayer session, um, you know, that's one of the things we could pray about, that all of us in this church will be prepared with this kind of fitness to witness for the Lord. Another area, putting away all differences. Now, I've been thankful. I have heard of several differences that have come up since I've been pastor here, but I am very pleased that each one got worked out. And we need to make sure we keep on doing that and keep those differences worked out. Putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy. I haven't seen anyone craving a certain position here, but that's always a temptation that can come along. They came close together in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God. The two things go together. The closer we can get to each other, that's why I wanted to have some of you share your testimony. It makes me think a lot more of you when I hear what God has done in your life. And also, you know, if there are any things that I need to share with you, I understand where you're coming from a little better. So, they came close together in Christian fellowship. And that's what God wants us to do here in this church. Um, we need to be close to the whole Adventist church as we can. But since we rub shoulders a lot, this is where we can be the closest together. And at the same time that that's happening, we're drawing closer to God. And each helps the other to progress. In Great Controversy 373, it describes those who started our church in the beginning, what they experienced, or at least some of them, what they experienced. If they were in the, in the uh, midnight cry, then they experienced this. With unspeakable desire, those who had received the message watched for the coming of their Savior. Many years ago, I got interested in the subject of the Holy Spirit. And as I started reading these things, I thought, wow, that's exactly what we need. How come we don't have that unspeakable desire for the message that God wants to give us? It's because we're not fully aware or fully living like we need to when the Most Holy Place work is going on. 
The time when they expected to meet him was at hand. They approached this hour with a calm solemnity. So they weren't all uh, excited, you know, because of some uh, powerful message that had been given to them or some powerful speaker had stirred them up. No. But <clears throat> they were on fire. Their hearts were uh, full of interest to be ready to meet him. They rested in sweet communion with God and earnest or down payment of the peace that was to be theirs in the bright hereafter. Now they thought they were getting ready for the second coming, but actually they were getting ready for the start of the most holy place. And what's amazing to me, they did the same things that we're supposed to do, even though they didn't know that the most holy place was going to be opened on October 22, 1844. None who experience this hope and trust can forget those precious hours of waiting. For some weeks preceding the time, worldly business was for the most part laid aside. But because it was only days, they could do that, just like on the Day of Atonement. We can't do that fully. But as I said earlier, I believe God is calling us to have less focus on the work that earns our living and more focus on getting ready. And if we do, we'll be ready because we'll get in a, a condition like they were. The sincere believers carefully examine every thought and emotion of their hearts as if upon their deathbeds and in a few hours to close their eyes upon earthly scenes. Is that the way we check ourselves out every day? I don't think it's natural for us to do that. And so it has to get to where it becomes natural for us. <clears throat> That's what they did. And under the influence of the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we're all going to be like that. And he wants to get us started in that direction right now carefully examining every thought and emotion of their hearts as if upon their deathbeds. All felt the need of internal evidence. When I read that, those two words I thought, now what's that? They all felt the internal evidence that they were prepared to meet the Savior. Their white robes were purity of soul, characters cleansed from sin by the atoning blood of Christ. I believe those two words are telling us that Jesus, when we are in the right relationship to him, he tells us that we're in the right position. This internal evidence that he gives us that we have the assurance that if he comes, we get to go with him. And that is what we need to look for uh, on a regular basis, I believe, as we go forward in, while he's in the most holy place. Would that there was still with the professed people of God the same spirit of heart searching, the same earnest, determined faith. That last, those last two words are important. We have to become more like Jacob. We know we have to be that way during Jacob's trouble, but we have to get more that way now. And we have to say, Lord, I did it again. But this has got to be the last time. I want to take hold of your power and not do this again. And that faith, that determined faith, is going to bring victories that we haven't gotten in the past. That's what they had. And if they got it way back there, there's no reason why we can't have it now. Had they continued thus to humble themselves before the Lord, 
and press their petitions at the mercy seat, they would be in possession of a far richer experience than they now have. That's talking about uh, God's people back then, but us as well, that we have less than what we could have. And so we could be having this far, not just a little bit richer experience, but a far richer experience than they now have. There is too little prayer, too little real conviction of sin. So yes, we acknowledge that we sin, but we don't really see it in a sinfulness. Too little real conviction of sin. And a lack of living faith leaves many destitute of the grace so richly provided by our Redeemer. Suppose we could be transported up to heaven and be shown the things we could have had, but we didn't believe that we could have them. We didn't ask Him, and so we didn't get them. I think there would be a lot of them that we just didn't get because we weren't really serious about going after it. But this is not the correct behavior for the time when Jesus is in the most holy place. And in closing, Early Writings 48 says, We must work while the day lasts. Working for souls has more to do with our being ready for the close of probation than many realize. We must work while the day lasts. For when the dark night of trouble and anguish comes, it will be too late to work for God. What is done to rescue souls from the coming storm of wrath must be done before Jesus leaves the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So, not only is God calling us while he's in the most holy place to really... Uh, streamline our lives in the direction of getting ready but he wants us to work to help anyone else that we can help to get ready because soon the work ends and we can't do any more for the salvation of those people may god help us as we consider these things to really become more in earnest for a deeper relationship with god and do those things that will bring it about. Find a way to do it. It's not easy. We live in a time when there are so many things to take our attention that it, in that sense it's the hardest time of Earth's history to push off the things that we need to push off so that we can have the time that we need to really get ready. But we know that there's a group that's going to have it happen so we can be in that group, right? Why not?